Paul, and good morning, everyone. So um, I think uh, almost all of you have heard me speak about um, the Exascale Computing Project. So um, in this talk, I'm going to assume that your memory is you know, reasonably good. Uh, I do have a few slides. Um, I, I thought of instead starting out with a quiz so that you could tell me what the project is. Um, but instead of doing that, uh, you know, so you can probably do a better job. I'll take notes. Uh, but um, so I'll have a few slides on that, and then I'll focus primarily on, you know, things that we've actually been doing uh, the, the last few months. So, so this um, is a slide that um, is meant to give you essentially the scope and the approach of the project very succinctly. Um, you know, the reasons for having an exascale computing project include being able to support national security, uh, develop applications uh, that have uh, a lot of impact on, on industry as well as fundamental science, and, and ones that can't be done on current systems. You know, unprecedented complexity is uh, meant to indicate that. Um, we care about economic competitiveness, uh, and that, of course, is one of the reasons I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk to this forum. Uh, it's very important to us. In terms of, you know, how do we get things done? Well, of course, I'll explain a little bit of that, but in terms of the computer systems, uh, we work with the vendors. Uh, we do not uh, uh, plan to design and then build our own system in some lab and and play with it. Uh, what we want uh, as an outcome is that we help uh, the um, business products to become better for Exascale and for HPC in general. So we work with the vendors to develop both a software stack, although we develop quite a bit of it uh, at national labs and universities, um, but work with the vendors and, and also on developing better hardware designs. Uh, people are, of course, always uh, essential, and, and part of uh, what we'll be doing is uh, training a large number of people on you know, very high-end HPC all the way to exascale. Uh, some of it is real training, and a lot of it will be on-the-job training, which is traditional in HPC. A lot of the learning that one does is by actually doing something, and there are lots of people doing something, as I will indicate. The um, uh, project is led by uh, DOE National Laboratories. Uh, 16 of the 17 national labs are involved in doing some of the work so far, uh, but six of them, you know, the ones that traditionally have fielded, operated, uh, advanced uh, HPC systems at the highest performance, those six are, uh, we call them the core partner labs, as you can see. And um, since um, it's a relatively big project and important to those labs as well as DOE as a whole. The, the lab directors have signed a memorandum of agreement, uh, all six lab directors uh, laying out roles and responsibilities for this project. Now I'm um, very pleased to have a, a team that has a lot of experience. I mean here we say decades of experience I and mean, cumulatively we added up over 300 years of experience in HPC and the leadership team and, and with expertise in all the areas. So I, <clears throat> I can uh, come here and uh, give talks uh, while you know, the leadership team is doing a fantastic job of running the project uh, while I'm gone. Now, uh, as a quick reminder, uh, you know, there are many challenges uh, for achieving what we consider to be useful exascale computing capability. Uh, we formulate these four as the main ones that we focus on, and they're broad enough that they have a lot of implications. So parallelism, a much greater level than we already have to do with, and that's already pretty bad. Um, memory and storage, you know, getting data in and out uh, of memory and the processing units uh, essentially has always been an issue with HPC, and it's getting to be more of an issue. So. <clears throat> Um, reliability, once you get systems with so many parts, uh, because you know, the parallelism will come from lots of additional parts, uh, then reliability becomes an issue. And uh, energy consumption, it's a matter of affordability. It's expensive to, um, to buy electricity, and so if we had to have 150 megawatts, of course you could do it, 
um, but it would be a very expensive uh, installation and then uh, a very expensive electric bill. So those are the, the four main challenges. And you know, there have been changes since the last time I spoke, but um, the main thing is um, the scope has not changed. We feel the only way to do this project is to uh, try to worry about everything. The applications need to be developed. A system software to support them needs to be developed, taking into account what the application's needs are at the exascale. As I mentioned, hardware technologies and, and architectures have to be enhanced to the extent possible to use less electricity, to have better memory access, better storage. And um, we need to make sure that we have the people who can carry out the work. So as from the very beginning, uh, this project is executed as a co-design among all those parts and um, with integration as being a major goal. So we, those are the, the way that we've organized the work is application development, which has many activities I'll describe briefly, software, hardware, and uh, the exascale systems. Think of the exascale systems as the facilities because this project, of course, has a lifetime. It's finite. Uh, the facilities, um, one thinks of as being of, of infinite lifetime. So the facilities at Oak Ridge, Argonne, Berkeley, Los Alamos, uh, Sandia, Livermore, uh, they're the ones um, that need to buy the systems and install them. And they have their own needs. So when I speak of co-design, they come into it as well. They have to have software to be able to manage those resources, to uh, find faults, um, and um, uh, <clears throat> want to make sure that uh, the, the technology for cooling, for example, is something that they can install at their sites and, and so on. So all four of those are engaged in co-design at all times, basically. So the, the new plan of record, and it may not be new to all of you, but uh, certainly since the last time I gave a talk at, at an HPC forum, it is new. It used to be a 10-year project. It's now a seven-year project. Uh, we continue to do it uh, in a co-design approach. Um, but since it's um, seven-year, now it, it ends on in 2022, but as usual, you have a a year of contingency, and so we can think of it as going through 2023 uh, scheduled contingency. Um, initially, or before, you know, as of last uh, September, for example, we had planned to field the first exascale systems in 2022, and uh, that there would be two or three of them in 2022 of diverse architectures. And now the, the change is that we'll have an initial exascale system delivered in 2021, expected to go into production in 2022. Um, and um, we say it'll be based on advanced architecture, meaning really that we're open to something that is not necessarily a, a direct um, <clears throat> uh, evolution of the systems that are currently installed or on order at um, the uh, National Lab facilities. Um, and then the um, capable exascale systems that I'll define in, uh, I think, the next slide, um, which will benefit, uh, as the, will the 2021 systems from the R&D that we do in the project. We, again, uh, currently expect them to be delivered in 2022 and deployed in 2023. And these will be, again, at the facilities that normally get systems. And just as a reminder, you know, lately it's been a, a collaboration of Argonne Oak Ridge and Livermore known as a coral collaboration that roughly every four years installs new systems. And then the collaboration of Berkeley, Los Alamos, and Sandia that in, um, in between years installs systems also about every four years at the high end. So again, just as a reminder, it's those facilities that will be buying the systems. We'll be doing the R&D uh, to hopefully give them something that's worth buying, put it that way. And um, the way that we define capable exascale is not by flops, uh, but what full applications can do relative to what they can do now on the petaflop systems that are, say, 10, 20 petaflops. So if you think of 20 petaflop systems as, uh, such as Titan and Sequoia uh, at uh, Oak Ridge and Livermore, respectively, uh, we think of, well, 50x times that of 
performance on full applications. Now, of course, there, there's a kink in this, uh, but it's something we'll deal with. The kink is that, you know, typically, people won't be running today's jobs on the exascale systems. The reasons we want exascales to do things we can't do today. And so we, we need to figure out a way to quantify complexity. In some cases, it can be easy if it's just a, a lot more resolution. Uh, but in many cases, it'll be additional physics uh, to more uh, faithfully represent the phenomenon. And, and so um, that will be complexity. But you know, we you know, definitely want to focus on measuring have we achieved capable exascale based on full applications, uh, tackling you know, real problems, and compared to what they can do today. Uh, the power one is an easy one to, to state and to measure. Resilience uh, to the uh, user, you know, on average, the user should not notice uh, a fault any uh, more than once a week. There may be faults every hour, but the user shouldn't see <clears throat> more than once a week. And then we feel that to be capable, it has to have a pretty healthy software stack because otherwise it'd be uh, a special purpose system or a system that's very difficult to use without adequate uh, support software. The um, um, cartoon here uh, is meant to indicate that you know, by injecting this project, the ECP, into the system, uh, we hope to get us on a trajectory that's both higher and has a different slope. As, as you can see, it uh, <clears throat> has a little bit bigger angle in the blue line than the uh, pink line. And, and so uh, you know, we hope with the R&D, this big investment in uh, people and R&D, that uh, we'll uh, go over onto this um, higher trajectory and keep going for a long time, yeah, even after the project is over, of course. Uh, applications uh, are, of course, uh, essential, both because it's only when you have applications running, hopefully, pretty much on day one uh, of the new systems uh, that you get the benefits. But between now and then, a huge benefit is they tell us what their requirements are in software, in hardware, to the extent possible that it's uh, possible to change the hardware in the intervening years. And so this list, uh, which, uh, of course, is a bit of an eye chart, is a list of the, uh, tw it represents the 26 applications that are currently supported by the ECP. Uh, in stockpile stewardship on the left, there are four applications, if you're trying to count the individual lines here. Um, so, um, you know, these slides will be posted, uh, so I won't read all of them, but I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on just a few of them to give you a feel for these. Uh, each of them, when selected, uh, specified a challenge problem. So it, it isn't just that they'll say, we'll do better chemistry. But, you know, we'll be able to do better chemistry, but there, here's a specific challenge problem that we expect to be able to tackle when those first exascale systems are available. And so here's one example, um, games. So this is a very widely used community code, about 150,000 users. And so, uh, not only is it a very good code, and they have ambitious uh, goals, but if we can succeed in helping that team achieve exascale for the games community code, the leverage is huge because it has all those users. Now, not all of them will need exascale to do their research, but those that do uh, will be able to do it quickly and more easily. And, and so this describes you know, in some detail, uh, their plans. Uh, another one, rather different, is uh, simulations of uh, earthquake hazards and risks. Um, that's obviously important uh, to society to be able to do a better job of um, those predictions, essentially. Uh, again, it's on, on the hazards, it's not on predicting when an earthquake will take place. Uh, another one, is um, wind turbine plant flow physics. Um, you know, there, <clears throat> uh, there's quite a bit of uh, electricity already generated in the United States and certainly in other countries through wind turbines. Um, and they're pretty good, uh, but there's still quite a bit of room for making them better. And especially when you have a wind plant of say a few hundred 
turbines uh, in irregular terrain, uh, it's a big computation to figure out how to lay them out as well as how to design the individual ones. But the uh, potential benefits are big. 30% uh, higher efficiency is, is the current estimate. And, and this is an exascale application. Um, speaking of uh, intermittent energy, because the wind doesn't always uh, blow in any given place, uh, that and uh, solar power and, and other issues um, are um, important to the national electric distribution grid. And so here's another fairly complex application um, that also has a time to solution dependency because if, if there are problems, you want to be able to react and uh, adjust the national grid so that you don't have brownouts or, or blackouts. And then uh, the last one um, that I'll mention here is uh, a collaboration between the uh, Department of Energy and the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute on cancer. And uh, as you might imagine, this is extremely important for society. And it's also quite different from, say, the traditional partial differential equation solving, because this one uh, will rely on uh, deep learning, machine learning, and uh, use of huge amounts of data um, being able to use millions of patient records for different types of cancer and what treatments they received, what the outcome was, as well as millions of potential cures that are known today. Uh, the individual's DNA that has been diagnosed with a particular type of cancer and using all those and, and deep learning to try to come up with precision medicine for that individual. Uh, it's a pretty tall order but um, it's something that um, I think is very worthwhile pursuing. And there's a fantastic team that it's a collaboration of people from the National Cancer Institute and a number of the DOE national labs. Um, so um, this alone seems to me uh, uh, has enough value to justify the whole project. Um, so, but that's not all that we do in what we call the applications uh, development focus area. Um, incidentally, you know, Doug Cothey leads that part of the project. Uh, you'll see Doug because he's leading uh, one of the sessions. Uh, unfortunately, I will miss because I have to leave today. Uh, but uh, you know, Doug is leading this um, whole applications development uh, part of the project. And, and so in addition to having those applications, um, uh, Doug has put in place five co-design centers because there are types of computing that apply to many applications. Um, and, you know, certainly those 26 applications that I mentioned briefly, uh, but also others. And so adaptive mesh refinement is one that comes up in a lot. Uh, data issues, the very first one, online data analysis and reduction at the exascale. Uh, particle and cell methods applies to many applications, discretization for PDE solving. And um, the most recent one is on graph analytics. Uh, so again, we're trying to emphasize in our latest moves on large-scale data analytics because that's a very uh, fast-growing application area that um, we have not traditionally covered. In addition, uh, although we will be measuring our success based on full applications, in the meantime, you can't always deal with a full application and so you need proxy apps. And so there's a, a new sub-project on developing proxy apps. Um, you know, the vendors uh, need this and uh, are always clamoring for proxy apps. Uh, we will need them to guide uh, in our software development, our application <coughs> development, and our uh, hardware uh, R&D with the vendors. So this is a, a brand new element of uh, the Exascale Computing Project. I apologize for the small print, but again, you can uh, download these and, and read them at your leisure. Um, and another one that's aimed at productivity and training is uh, an outgrowth of uh, a previous project called Ideas, uh, led by Mike Hurro and Lois McInnes. And um, you know, they now have uh, Ideas-ECP. And the idea is to come up with productivity uh, methods and teach people how to use them. Uh, so um, this, again, is uh, brand new as of a couple of months ago. 
but um, you can see there's a lot of outreach, already a lot of um, you know, mini symposia, uh, workshops on, and tutorials on you know, software productivity and software sustainability. It's very important given how much software this project will be generating and training the people. And speaking of training, this uh, project has also taken over the Argon uh, training program on extreme scale computing. It is now funding this uh, activity, which is a, a two week summer training program uh, at the very high end of, of HPC. So this is intended for people who already know how to use MPI, OpenMP, have already implemented some non-trivial parallel application, um, and we get them to the next uh, scale of uh, expertise. So the next one will be um, this coming July 30th to August 11th. Uh, they're held outside of uh, Chicago. and. Um, if you're interested in this, well, for this year, we've already uh, closed uh, the applications and selected the participants, but uh, uh, we have online lectures from previous years. So, for example, from last year, I believe there are 86 lectures that are online uh, on the Argonne YouTube channel, and uh, you can get them and look at them. And, in fact, I, I know quite a few people who around the world have looked at uh, some of those lectures. Uh, the uh, URL is listed there, extremecomputingtraining.inl.gov. So that's another aspect of the application development uh, focus area. Um, software stack, uh, I believe I showed this software stack last September. Um, so it's a notional one, of course. You, we include applications and co-design in here. Um, and along the sides, the resilience and workflows shown vertically because we believe they uh, impact uh, all aspects of the software stack. Um, but now uh, it's filled in. Um, and uh, again, you'll have to read this, uh, the individual pieces offline, but you can see we're investing in several different programming models. You know, the ones that we know will be needed in Essential, MPI, and OpenMP, for example. But then additional ones, you know, Legion uh, is an asynchronous task model language. It's a young language, um, but it is being used by a couple of the applications, maybe adopted by others, and so we're investing in that. And so in a number of areas, we're investing in several approaches to accomplish the same functionality. At some point, we'll be paring things down. And uh, at the same time, we feel we probably have some gaps, in the, especially in the data issues. And so we're in the process of doing a, a gap analysis for our software stack. Uh, this is very complex, and you have to have integration uh, among the individual pieces up and down, as well as having them be useful to the applications and use the hardware effectively. Um, so just to give you an idea of you know, co-design in the context of software, um, you know, each of those projects, and there are 66 of them, by the way, uh, 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 and the application projects have milestones. Some of, them, some of them we call shared milestones because we want the application that has a requirement and the software project that tries to meet that requirement to work together, not to you know, state the requirement and say, come back when you have a solution. You have to work together. So we have shared milestones. So here's one that uh, I selected simply because it was fairly easy to describe. So um, they're aiming at, by the end of uh, next calendar year, to have new prototype APIs to have better coordination between MPI and OpenMP runtimes. Because this is an issue now in governing the, <clears throat> the threads, messages, and, and, and ranks when, you're, when you use both programming models, which a fair number of applications are doing. So how is this going to work? Well, the, um, the software team that's doing this is interacting with a number of the application development teams. That's what AD stands for, application development. Make sure we understand their requirements about runtime coordination. And then there are other software technology teams that also deal with the runtimes, coordinate with them. and experiment with prototype implementations of these APIs on the test beds that we have at any given point in time. We can't wait until we have the 
exascale systems to actually try things out. So as you can see, there's a lot of interaction here, and this is just one uh, out of basically several hundred such activities uh, that are going on. So it's um, effort intensive. Co-design is. Integration is difficult. Uh, but we have to start now, and, and this is how we're doing it. In hardware technologies, um, you probably are all familiar with the Path Forward program, but just as a quick reminder, is, um, we uh, issued an RFP to the vendor community uh, asking them to propose three-year R&D projects that would result in better hardware at the node level, memory, uh, system level, and aimed at you know, lower energy consumption, uh, better programmability, and, and so on. And um, the idea is that um, the, the result after three years hopefully the successful things will become part of a product line that then can be bid as uh, there's an RFP that the facilities will issue for the first exascale systems. So um, that's the goal of Path Forward. Um, and then um, we want to be able to measure how effective those uh, new ideas are likely to be. And so we've also launched a design space evaluation effort that I'll give just a tiny bit more detail on in, in a moment. So what's been happening with those, um, the results of the RFP is that um, you know, we selected six vendors to be primes. Uh, in some cases, they have uh, uh, other vendors involved in their R&D plans and uh, have been working on detailed statements of work. And because the dollar amounts are pretty hefty, uh, the approval process goes all the way up to pretty high up in the Department of Energy headquarters. So think delays, you know, lots of uh, bureaucracy involved. But we're essentially done with five of the six, and the sixth one is not too far off. It would have been great if we uh, had been able to announce them at this HPC forum, uh, but uh, it was not meant to be. <laughs> Uh, so it, uh, hopefully it'll be just a few more weeks. And, and so um, this is a very important part of the program, obviously. Not, not only is it a lot of money, but the, this is the way to try to um, make sure that our ideas of requirements uh, working with the vendors result in better HPC systems for all, uh, not just for the uh, initial access scale systems. And uh, the design space evaluation uh, involves uh, seven of the labs. You can see in the column on the left. And um, the labs traditionally have done you know, simulations of various kinds. Some are cycle accurate simulations, obviously very slow. Uh, some are a higher level. And so they already have in place tools. And they will be applying those tools and sharing those tools, uh, the names of which appear here, like Aspen, Palm, Biffle, and, and so on. And, and so this. Also an important part of the project will be to, to try to estimate early on how good are the new ideas, and then also uh, once the actual hardware is in place and we can measure things, verify our uh, predictions. Um, almost done, uh, so you know, we're doing well time-wise. Uh, as I've already mentioned, you can't wait until we have the first exascale systems uh, to do any programming, so we have to have uh, access to today's leading edge systems and uh, tomorrow's as well. So well, we have access for our projects now to uh, NERSC's uh, Cori system and um, uh, Oak Ridge's Titan. Uh, those, of course, are leading edge systems and are in use now. And uh, we've arranged for test beds of uh, coming systems. So at Argonne uh, Leadership Computing Facility, the Theta system, has been expanded a little bit, um, and then we get a share of that as a result. And um, uh, likewise, at, at Oak Ridge, there's a, a prototype of their next system, Summit, and so we have access to that. Now, those two test beds are not huge, um, but initially, what you really care about anyway is you're developing software is at the node level, or a few nodes. Um, and uh, we expect every year to be adding to the test beds. Some will be um, um, you know, hopefully every single year we'll have uh, some new test beds. Some will be small, uh, some will be parts of a bigger system. 
so we have to do that. Um, we um, submitted a proposal to the um, DOE Oscar Leadership Computing Challenge, ALCC, for quite a big chunk of time. Uh, we'll find out, I think, in May whether it's successful or not. I hope so because, you know, with 26 application teams, 66 software technology projects, we need access to hardware. <laughs> and so it would be uh, ironic if, uh, if we couldn't uh, <laughs> do anything on hardware um, with all those projects. But that'll happen. Um, <clears throat> we are trying to do um, a fair amount of communication and outreach. We, we have a website if you haven't discovered it yet. There's a URL for that. Uh, that's been up for a couple of months, a few months. Um, in addition, though, we just launched a newsletter, the ECP update. Uh, this will be coming out roughly once a month, but on, you know, in, in between uh, as appropriate as well and give you updates on what's going on. There's a URL for that. Um, internal meetings, we had the first PI meeting. And at that time, we had over 80 PIs, and, and that was meant to uh, get all the PIs fam familiar with what the other PIs are doing because, again, we need to work together all the time. That was followed by the first annual meeting. Uh, that involved over 450 people, and 80% of the time was not on plenary sessions and people giving lectures. 80% uh, of the time was on about 15 concurrent sessions with different teams talking to each other in detail about these shared milestones, their needs, and how they could be met. So it was very interactive, uh, intensive meeting. Uh, some of the groups met for a full day before the annual meeting and for a full day after as well, which made it a full week for them. Um, and 450 people was not all the people that are involved in the project, uh, but that's how many we had. And um, <clears throat> we established an, an industry council that the next presentation we'll talk about, so I won't describe it other than to say we established it and we had its first meeting March 6th and 7th. So um, I'll close with this just to give you an idea of the scale. So. We have 22 DOE labs, well, 16 DOE labs, and, and then other agency partners. So uh, NIST, for example, National Institutes for Standards and Technology, is involved in one of the applications. Uh, we have nine private sector companies currently, and that does not include the path forward ones because they haven't been announced yet. Uh, there are 39 university research partners. We hope to have more. Our plan is to solicit more industry and university collaboration, but that's the current level. And then the industry council has 18 members at present. Now, there are gaps. Uh, we, we have, we're not in, in every 50 state or anything like that, but we have pretty good um, uh, representation. And you know, currently there are about 800 researchers doing work. As I mentioned, 26 application development projects. 66 software development projects, and five co-design centers, as, as well as other activities. So that's uh, where we are now, a lot of progress in the last few months. And um, you know, I hope in six to 12 months, if I get a chance to speak to you again, there'll be even more progress. And uh, thank you for your attention, and I think we have time for a few questions. So the question is, what's the policy for including people outside of the U.S. in this project? People who are based outside of the U.S. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, I would say the policy is that uh, they're not included. Um, certainly, uh, people who are in the U.S. are of many nationalities. Any other questions? Uh, uh, Yes, the answer, uh, the question is whether the work on wind farms includes acoustic uh, effects. Well, uh, even today, in, in fact, that um, the leadership facilities, uh, such as the Argonne one, there has been for s several years a, a project that does focus on acoustics because that, that is an issue indeed. It's not just the efficiency. Uh, yeah, so uh, 
So that will be part of it. Uh, the, the main thrust of the ECP supported uh, wind farm application is on the placement of, of the turbines in wind farms, but some of the work is on the individual you know, blade design, which involves uh, wind as well as, uh, I'm sorry, um, noise. Um, <clears throat> because some, some of the research done, in this case, Bob Moser is a collaborator from University of Texas, Austin, and, and uh, he's an expert in the turbulence which of course is one of the reasons that you get the vibration and therefore the acoustics. So there's a lot of emphasis on the hardware part and one of the slides had talked about software developer efficiency. What are you doing on the software side to make it uh, more efficient for developers? Well, we have the, um, the, the software productivity uh, activity, which uh, is you know, to uh, train people on, on more productive uh, ways to do their software development and software engineering so that there's uh, maintainability and, and more reliability. Uh, we're investing in, as I mentioned, in different programming models, you know, such as uh, Legion, which are, you know, there's a hope that um, they, uh, it's easier to program in them and therefore you have uh, more productive uh, people. You mentioned a lot of emphasis on hardware, which surprises me a little bit because uh, I spoke more minutes, I'm sure, on applications and software than I did on the hardware. Um, uh, so, you know, hardware is important, but we're investing far more on the applications themes, on the software productivity and software technology development than on the hardware, even though we do have a sizable investment in the hardware. Are you looking into any alternative designs like uh, the Vortex bladeless designs? The, the Vortex what? Bladeless? No. No. I, I, I guess I, I'm not sure that I know what you're referring to. Yeah, okay. So, well, there's a, there's a Spanish uh, startup that's, uh, that's designed a bladeless uh, uh, turbine. And, uh, oh, oh, you're talking about turbines. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. I, I, Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know the context. I thought you were talking about uh, uh, hardware design. Uh, Paul, for example, the, uh, the candle application that's combining deep learning with data analytics, I wonder if you see an architectural fork in, in the plan ahead where you have PDE-based architectures and uh, data and machine learning architectures as those two sort of diverge into separate uh, domains of expertise? Well, um, yeah, certainly one of our, uh, I'll, I'll say, second level goals uh, is to try to, in fact, promote convergence as opposed to divergence. Huh. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know that we'll be successful in that, to be honest, but, but that's what we're hoping to do, to understand better uh, because we don't have a good understanding of the needs for deep learning and uh, large-scale data analytics. Well, I think we have a better understanding of the more classical HPC, uh, but since we'll have projects of each kind and we hope to in fact get more of the second kind of data analytics and machine learning that uh, you know, we hope in fact to, within the software stack but possibly also within the hardware system architecture promote a convergence. So that's, that is a goal um, it's an ambitious one. Yeah, all right, and good luck. It's an important one because I think in many cases you, you will need both, in fact. So I actually had a hardware question. So is that, how much effort is involved in like S&T of advanced component designs like memristor-based storage and, and things like that that might not be ready by 2022, 2023, but might be part of the next iteration of, of a project like this? So to some extent, um, we, we recognize that there are some things that are already in flight, um, but may not be a, a real product uh, by, for the 2021, to be part of the 2021 machine or even the 2022 one. And so we, um, we plan to still look into those and uh, at least do some preliminary work. Um, we, um, we issued an RFI not an RFP, 
just a couple of months ago, uh, jointly with the facilities, and it was a very broad RFI, and, and, and part of that we asked for what would be available as far out as say 2024, 2025, and we did that on purpose because although we, we need more detail on the things that are closer in so that we can write an, um, a reasonable RFP for the first exascale systems, we wanted to make it clear that we're not stopping there, and so if we can start getting ideas of what may be available, even if it's after the lifetime of this project, the facilities will be around. And so to the extent possible, we, we would indeed want to experiment with that. Um, in the, I mentioned the test beds, although most of them we expect will be um, exemplars of what might become the, in a larger scale, the, the first exascale systems. To the extent possible, we're also thinking of having test beds that are prototypes of very different kinds of hardware of the type you mentioned so that we can do some real experimentation. Thank you. Yeah. And could you say a little bit more about the graph analytics initiative that you mentioned? Well, that's a uh, brand new co-design center. Uh, I, I must admit, I can't speak to it in, in detail. And it, it was just uh, funded about, uh, what, a month ago, I, I think, Doug? Uh, so uh, they're just barely getting started. Uh, so I think offline we, we can give you a little bit more uh, information. And, and, and you could talk to, to Doug uh, during the break, perhaps, to Doug Cothy. Yeah, but it's, it's a co-design center, so it's going to be working with several applications. So, for example, the electric grid is, is one uh, of the applications that does uh, graph analytics. Um, uh, there's a project I didn't talk about in detail in urban science that also you know, would need that, for example. So there are several applications that need it. The co-design center will be developing you know, general methods and implementations of those methods that can be used by different applications. So they don't all each have to figure out uh, how to do things on, at the exascale. Okay, perhaps uh, in the interest of time, well, thank you for all the questions. Let me introduce um, David Martin and Susie Tischner, who will tell you about the exascale computing project uh, industry council. I, I believe it's a tag team. Uh, so David will start and, and then Susie will contribute and uh, you'll uh, switch, switch over, over to, thank you very much. <laughs> sure.